It is a year since the special cell of the Delhi police carried out vicious and sweeping raids on the offices of NewsClick and the residences of virtually everyone associated with it. The raids were conducted in five cities. They involved the seizure of about 500 electronic devices of more than 80 journalists and other employees without any adherence to due process, such as the provision of seizure memos, hash values of the seized data, or even copies of the data. The police sealed the news portal's main office. They arrested NewsClick's founder editor, Prabir Purkhayasta, and its administrative officer, Amit Chakravarti, on terrorism-related charges. And as though this was not enough, searches were conducted at the premises of NewsClick and the home of its founder editor after a fresh criminal case was filed by the Central Bureau of Investigation, the fifth probe agency director from above to set about this medium-sized digital news organization. The bizarre FIR and the bulky charge sheet registered in the case take us into the raw and muddled police mind. They let us imagine what a dystopian police state would look like if allowed free reign by the courts. In parallel, the income tax department, with its over-the-top demands, froze the bank account of the organization, making it virtually impossible for it to pay those working for it. A Supreme Court stay order has come as a welcome relief, but is yet, is yet to be given effect to. What we can say without exaggeration is that the military-style assault on NewsClick marks the lowest point for media freedom in India since the emergency of 1975-1977. But this is not essentially a story about the police running riot. It's a political story. The story of an authoritarian regime at war with a medium-sized progressive and left-oriented digital news network and the independent, critical and challenging journalism that it represents. We are happy that Prabir, whose health was at risk during his incarceration, is out on bail. I spoke to him a little while ago before recording this video. For all of us, Prabir is a symbol of resistance against the authoritarian state's attempt to suppress the independent, critical and pro-people news media. I'd like it to be, I, or I'd like to be at the Delhi Press Club with you on this anniversary of the infamous assault, but I'll be traveling abroad during this period and hence this recorded message. Let's now spend a couple of minutes looking at the broader picture. The Modi government has conducted targeted assaults on freedom of expression, media freedom and independence, and other fundamental rights. It has used anti-terror, sedition, and other draconian laws to incarcerate without bail or trial and for prolonged periods, journalists, students, human rights defenders, civil society activists, and troublesome critics of the government. The post-2014 downslide in media freedom and independence has seen India plummet in 2024 to the rank of 159 among 180 countries and territories in the World Press Freedom Index published by Reporters Without Borders. The government has made a concerted effort to police and censor the internet, the social media, technology platforms that deliver streamed content via internet-connected devices and digital news providers. It has almost certainly conducted illegal surveillance against a large number of journalists, along with politicians, civil society activists, and other selected targets by deploying NSO Group's military-grade spyware, Pegasus. The matter is pending before the Supreme Court of India, and I'm a petitioner in this case, so I'll say no more about it. Shockingly, in the decade 2014 to 2024, 19 journalists have been murdered in connection with their work across India, compared with 11 during the previous decade. Since 1992, the New York-based Independent Committee to Protect Journalists, CPJ, has meticulously, after careful inquiry and strict verification, 
documented the work-related killing of journalists worldwide. In recent years, India has been characterized by CPJ as one of the most dangerous places for journalists, especially investigative reporters, to do their job. Research suggests that communal and other forms of divisive politics and social polarization across India have made an already bad situation worse. But this is not all. Since 2008, CPJ has been publishing an annual Global Impunity Index. This is a quantified ranking of countries where journalists are murdered, the cases remain unsolved, and no conviction has been obtained. In other words, the rule of law does not apply when journalists are murdered in the course of their work. I regret to say that year after year, India fi finds itself among the dozen or so countries that figure in the Global Impunity Index, this club of shame. We were heartened by the widespread protests across the country, by journalists, lawyers, political and social activists, and members of the public against what happened on October 3, 2023 and thereafter. Newspapers published editorials and articles condemning or criticizing the government's attack on NewsClick. Press clubs, organizations of working journalists, and professional bodies, notably the Editors Guild of India, Digipub, and the Network of Women in Media India, as well as the New York-based Committee to Protect Journalists, registered their condemnation. Equally important, the matter has been taken to court with wholehearted support from some of India's top lawyers who have appeared bo pro bono. But this is not enough. The campaign to defend media independence and freedom cannot succeed if it is episodic. Repression by the state can be resisted and faced down in various ways. A bigger challenge today is to sustain and develop the campaign in a toxic information ecosystem where disinformation and the politics of hate run riot in the social media and, and also in some sections of the mainstream media. The momentum generated by the protests against the assaults on the targeted media organizations and journalists must be used to build a democratic movement that consistently champions freedom of speech and expression and media freedom as a vital component of this fundamental right. There has been a positive change in the national political situation that augurs well for us. With the ruling party losing its majority in the 2024 Lok Sabha election, the ground has shifted beneath the strongman's feet, with cracks opening up in various places. We can see some positive changes in the way institutions, including courts and the media, are responding to the authoritarian state's arbitrary actions. The only way to defend our right to free speech and independence is to exercise it individually and collectively, come what may. That, I think, is a message that needs to go out from our observance of October 3 as a day of solidarity with NewsClick, with Prabir, and with other journalists, including those in Jammu and Kashmir, who have been targeted.